Welcome to the Top Business Leader Show, powered by Rise 25 Media. We feature top founders, executives, and business leaders from all over the world. Chad Franzen here, co-host for the show, where we feature top restaurateurs, investors, and business leaders. This is part of our Spot On series. Spot On has the best-in-class payment platform for retail, and they have a flagship solution called Spot On Restaurant, where they combine marketing, software, and payments all in one. They have... Uh, They've served everyone from larger chains like Dairy Queen and Subway to small mom and pop restaurants. To learn more, go to spoton.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. We help B2B businesses to get ROI, clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships through Done For You podcasts. If you have a B2B business and want to build great relationships with clients, referral partners, and thought leaders in your space, there's no better way to do it than through podcasts and content marketing. To learn more, go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise 25com Com. My guest today is Jonah Goldman. Jonah is the co-founder and director of strategic marketing of Plant Burger. That's spelled P-L-N-T Burger. He is a marketing specialist, social entrepreneur, and environmental activist with a background in the natural food industry, regenerative, regenerative agriculture, compostable packaging, and fighting food waste. Hey, Jonah, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm doing well, Chad. Thank you so much uh, for hosting me and for that wonderful if not wordy and lengthy introduction. <laughs> hey, uh, it's great to have you. Hey, so as I mentioned, you spell your restaurant, uh, it's called Plant Burger, but you spell it P-L-N-T. Tell me a little bit about that and uh, why that is the case. Absolutely. So it has to do with our mission statement, which is to empower more people to enjoy delicious plant-based alternatives, which in turn can create a more just and plentiful food system for all and a healthier planet for future generations. So in that mission statement, you heard the words plant, planet, plenty. And we seek to uh, unite all of those in our name, PLNT. Um, internally, those letters are also an acronym, uh, and it stands for positivity, learning, nourishment, and togetherness, which uh, is the culture that we want to embody for our team, for our guests, and for uh, everyone who who comes into contact with our um, with our brand. Good for you. Hey, uh, uh, we I talked a little bit before we started recording about your background, give me an idea as to what, what your background is and tell everybody what your background is. You, uh, you're a restaurateur in the sense that you, you founded Plant Burger, but you're, you know, your, your background doesn't totally go into restaurants. So t tell us a little bit about your history. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I would be remiss if I took entire credit for starting Plant Burger. Um, I can't do that. I, uh, you know, am blessed to be part of a really phenomenal team of entrepreneurs who have, more experience than I do in the restaurant industry, um, social entrepreneurs, uh, people like Margarita Herdosia, uh, Seth Goldman, um, Spike Mendelson, Mike Coletti, Ben Kaplan. Um, really, they were the, the ones who came together to make Plant Burger a reality with me. And I brought my marketing expertise and, and branding um, strategy to, to bear, but uh, it definitely would not have happened without those other amazing founders. So really grateful to, to be working with them um, and uh, to continue to grow the business. As for my personal um, history and, uh, and work experience, it really all began with an interest in food systems that was sparked by a trip to a sanctuary. Uh, as a 10-year-old, um, I visited a animal sanctuary called Poplar Spring. It's located in Poolsville, Maryland. And I think as kids, you really are not desensitized at that point to um, a lot of issues. But for me, when I came into contact with animals like goats, pigs, cows, chickens, as a 10-year-old, you fall in love with these animals. Uh, we're all born with that innate compassion for the other sentient creatures. Um, you see it when kids are interacting with dogs or cats or bunnies. We love our pets. Uh, naturally, we're inclined towards uh, towards love. Um, and so as a 10 year old, I you know, had a great experience with these animals. And then we went to dinner at this restaurant, our favorite rotisserie chicken place called El Pollo Rico. And I noticed there was a similarity in the shape between the animal that we were eating and the animal that we'd spent all day having a great time with. And so I asked my parents, what is the difference between this animal we're eating and the animals that we just got to know so well clearly had such character. They had social lives. They had a desire to live. Um, 
And in many ways, we're really similar to, to humans. Uh, so I was sort of confused when they told me there's not really a difference. The one that we spent all day with was a rescue. And the one that we're eating was not a rescue or it was a victim. And uh, at that point, I totally swore off eating animal products um, or at least animal flesh. Uh, any animal that I didn't personally kill, I, I didn't want to be a part of supporting um, a system that victimized those animals um, because it's not something that I would want to do to to others. Um, <laughs> that was really what started my journey into food systems. And I learned uh, at a very early age, in fact, directly after that experience about how meat in America comes to consumers. And the sad reality is that the vast majority, over 90% of the meat products we consume in America come from CAFOs or confined animal feeding operations and have a really disastrous um, impact on the planet. Uh, they, they are cruel systems towards the animals and ultimately they create products that um, are harmful for humans to consume as well. Part of that is because these animals are not being raised in their natural environment. They're not able to exhibit natural behavior and instinct and they are instead being caged uh, and, and given really awful conditions, foods that they're not meant to process in their, in their digester tracts. That results in excess um, fat and tumors and uh, all sorts of other health problems. Um, and those complications deliver an uh, end, end product that um, we know is directly linked to heart disease, uh, to diet-related issues um, as well. And, and that's part of why in America we see such high rates of um, Again, heart disease is the number one killer of, of Americans. Uh, diabetes and and um, and other issues really stem from our overconsumption of processed meats and red meats. And so this became an issue that I really wanted to learn more about. Um, and uh, the more I learned about the food system that exists in America and the the global food system, the more I became passionate about changing it and uh, finding marketplace solutions that could replace those same foods because. As a 10 year old, what's your favorite food? Everyone wants to go to Mickey D's, right? We all wanted to go to McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge sacrifice um, for me. So I, at a very early age, was passionate about bringing uh, a, a vegan or a plant-based alternative to fast food into the into the world. And it wasn't until, you know, later in life um, that I was able to, to realize that, that dream. And it came through, uh, you know, a long uh, career of, of working in food startups working in the natural food industry, um, working in um, plant-based meat alternative startups at so the early stage beyond meat. Um, back in 2013, I had the opportunity to intern there. And that definitely was a, a pivotal moment in my career where I realized this is this has the potential to really positively impact the food system on a global level and an industrial level. And I just got so excited about that, that uh, that really became um, the driving motive behind my work um, and has led me to uh, what it is that I'm doing today. Good for you. You know, uh, you developed strong kind of beliefs, convictions, values at the age of 10 uh, and, and you stuck with them. I know I, I developed anything I developed at the age of 10. I quickly abandoned by the time I was 11, but uh, it, that's, that's a credit to you. I know you've spent some time outside of the U S as well. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so I had, Spent five years in Colorado studying food systems, um, and that was actually a really interesting time for me as well, where I got to get outside of that um, plant-based space, uh, and I actually worked on farms where I was raising chickens, I was raising sheep, um, and bringing them to slaughter as well, and so I got to see what what that meat processing uh, looks like, both on a small scale and on a large scale. Um, and from that experience, was able to really answer some important questions uh, around the environmental impact that that has and the impact that it has on on people. Um, and ultimately, from that, you know, I learned that human suffering, animal suffering, and human suffering are linked. Uh, where animals are suffering, humans are suffering. And even in the best case scenario, uh, I, I just don't want to contribute to the unnecessary suffering of the other sentient creatures on the planet. Um, and at that point, I'd spent a lot of time my entire career in the United States. And I was really curious to get out of my comfort zone and 
experience a, a new culture and a new way of looking at things and also to, to dive deeper into the world of sustainable agriculture. So I went to the hub, the, the, the global center of agricultural innovation, Israel, and, um, and I got to, uh, to study those, um, those topics on a uh, educational farm in Modi'in, which is in the center of Israel. Uh, the farm is called Chavave Adam. And I learned about regenerative agriculture there. I learned about polyculture, uh, permaculture, and things like drip agriculture, um, con conservation methods for growing food in a way that benefits all of the stakeholders as opposed to exploiting and depleting those stakeholders. Um, so thinking of the air and the soil and the water as stakeholders as well in the equation uh, was, was a really different um, lens that I hadn't yet experienced um, and one that I now firmly believe in supporting uh, and transitioning our industrial processes and, and practices to be more in line with um, ecology. Uh, and I became an Israeli citizen. I uh, continued to teach courses on that farm for around two and a half years. And then I had the opportunity to work with um, this amazing nonprofit called Robin Food, which um, is in the north of Israel in, in Haifa. And what they do is amazing and inspirational. I'll just share it with you briefly, but um, they rescue food from distributors, from farms, from retailers, and they uh, transform that rescued food into delicious, healthy meals for the public. Um, when they had a restaurant, it was available to the public on a pay-as-you-can, pay-as-you-feel basis. And then what they pivoted to now is developing resources for consumers to address their own food waste. Uh, around 40% of food waste is on the consumer level. So it's things that you and I may be missing um, and, uh, and waste that comes out of our own fridges or excess food that we put on our plates because our eyes were bigger than our stomachs. Um, so developing inventory, something as simple as just like really thinking uh, through your inventory and, um, and, and turning your leftovers into a delicious reimagined dish is a really great way to uh, cut back on your personal um, food waste, which is ultimately a big part of our environmental footprint as well. If we're able to let waste less food, uh, not only are we going to be able to um, capitalize on all the resources that it went in, uh, that went into making that food, but we're also going to reduce the methane gas and emissions that come from um, landfilling food that should other that would otherwise be consumed. Um, and then at the end of my time in Israel, I had the opportunity to work with a startup called Tipa, which is a industrial engineering firm um, designing and, and manufacturing uh, biodegradable and compostable solutions to um, single use plastics. So uh, through the combination of conventional polymers and biopolymers, coming up with materials that imitate plastic um, in every sense of, of the, the properties that plastic has, but have a solution for their end of life. They can return um, to the soil and they can become fertilizers, which again goes back into strengthening soil um, and ultimately building up those resources, which we know to be so vital to the ecosystem services we need as humans to continue to survive. Um, and uh, so as I was working with them, I was doing PR and marketing and started to have conversations with uh, the world-renowned chef Spike Mendelson about bringing um, this concept for a plant-based, planet-friendly burger joint. Um, we, we started to think about how it would manifest. And uh, in July of 2019, I came back to the United States. And in September of 2019, we opened the first plant burger in Silver Spring, Maryland, inside of the Whole Foods. Nice. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Um, so how did you guys come up with all of the menu items and the concepts and everything like that? Had they been percolating for a while? Most definitely. Yeah, we looked at the competitive set um, as far as QSRs uh, in our um, general space and in our region. Uh, so we analyzed the menus of Shake Shack, Wendy's, Five Guys, you know, McDonald's, Burger King, you name it. We really looked at every other competitor and what they were um, offering and what they were uh, charging for those items. And we crafted our menu uh, to really be in the center of all of that competition. Um, and we went as so far as to uh, 
you know, price price our our burgers um, a little under where we were seeing the the vast majority of our competition. Um, we want to make plant based food accessible to the masses, and in order to do that, you you really um, you have to be under the cost of the burger fi and the five guys and the um, shake shacks of the world. So uh, I'm proud to say that we still offer extremely competitive pricing, um, even through all of these challenges around supply chain and increases in the cost of goods. Um, we are, are right in the middle of the pack. Uh, we still can't offer the same prices as McDonald's uh, because we haven't scaled to that point yet. Mm -hmm. But um, it's worth noting that you know McDonald's has been around for a very long time and has developed a tremendous scale um, that enables them to offer products that are also very cheaply produced and um, have other negative downsides. Uh, so we we hope to ultimately scale to that size and um, cut our prices to the point where we'd be able to provide you know a burger to a consumer at the same price as McDonald's. And it comes with so many health benefits and environmental benefits to boot. So you opened in a in a uh, Whole Foods almost four years, three and a half, four years ago. Um, what was the initial response like? Well, we were really lucky to open in the uh, Whole Foods in Silver Spring, which um, is just happens to be one of the most uplifting environments to open a business. Um, Whole Foods in Silver Spring is an incredibly diverse and uh, joyful environment. Um, so, so we got really lucky. And, and I'll, I'll also just note that uh, the day that I came back from Israel, I had arrived um, at around 9 a.m. On, on my flight. And at 11 a.m., we were pitching to the Whole Foods executives. And wow. we, we had a sampling. Uh, and they loved our idea. They, they thought the concept of chef-crafted Planet Friendly Burgers was uh, was was great, and they said we'll give you a shot at this venue in um, the Silver Spring Whole Foods. The venue itself is 110 square feet, so it's a little shoebox, and we just have enough space for a register, our uh, flat top, our fryer, and an ice cream machine. That's it. <laughs> it's just that, and then our assembly line. Um, and we were really well received, and and so uh, from our timeline, you probably you know, realized that we opened around six months before the beginning of COVID. Yeah. So um, we had a grand opening that was very well attended. We had a line that wrapped around the dairy section and all the way around the, the uh, entire Whole Foods store, all the way over to the produce section. Um, so we had around 200 people in a line that um, just came to celebrate the opening of our, our new concept with us. Um, we very quickly became the number one top performing friend of Whole Foods in the region. Uh, they have a program that we were a part of, of course, the Friends of Whole Foods program. Um, and so through a really aggressive sampling program, um, we would greet shoppers as they came into the Whole Foods with a sweet potato fry or with a little sample of our chili and give them a sticker and tell them, you know, you can use this sticker for 10% off your order for lunch today at, at Plant Burger. We're new to the Whole Foods. And that was really able to drum up a ton of uh, momentum and sales and build our community. In addition to that, we had um, a really great approach to community engagement that involved fundraising with local nonprofits, schools, and PTSAs. And that was really responsible for this groundswell of support um, that enabled us to become the number one best performing friend in that region. Um, and then, you know, we were proud of that uh, accomplishment and Whole Foods was excited by our initial success. And so when the pandemic hit, um, we had to face this choice of, do we shrink and, and do we close this and, and wait it out? Or should we be opportunistic and, and take, take on more growth opportunities? Um, and venues became available, uh, of course, in the prepared food section of these Whole Foods in the region due to the fact that they had shut down their prepared in, in most cases, shut down most of their pre prepared food sections. Um, and so we decided to go in, in that direction of continuing to provide jobs to more people um, and continuing to grow uh, our sales through the pandemic. So are most of your loc you, you now have 10 locations. Is that right? Uh, I kind of counted 13. them on your 13, 13 locations. Um, are they all in Whole Foods? 11 of our 13 are in Whole Foods. 
in January of uh, 2022, we opened our flagship location in New York in Union Square. This is outside of Whole Foods. And then we followed that up with another flagship location in the Nomad neighborhood of uh, New York. So two locations in Manhattan uh, are not inside of Whole Foods. They're standalone. But every other, those, those are standalone. That's right. And mm -hmm. uh, every other location, which um, now spans almost the entire East Coast, um, are inside of Whole Foods. So we have two locations in the greater Boston area. And we have two locations right outside of Philly. Um, we have three in Maryland, two in D.C., two in Virginia. So, uh, what our can you tell me like. what it what it's like for a customer? Like, what what's the experience like for a customer to go into one of those standalone locations? Like, like what's the vibe? Uh, does it have like a burger joint smell? I mean, can you tell me about the tell me about all that? Sure. Yeah. It's uh, it's a really great aesthetic. Um, we have some of the best designers on our team as well who um, have developed this really great combination of some nostalgia from the burger joints of the 1970s and this retro feel of uh, the booths and the way that our kiosk is framed by these big, bold turquoise rims uh, with this futuristic aesthetic um that's that's clean and has uh i i think just evokes um openness and happiness uh that's really what we aim to achieve you'll also notice when you were if you walk into either of these locations that we have a sign on the door that lists uh our hours of operation of course but it also lists our brand attributes so we're 100 percent kosher we're halal uh, we have gluten-free options soy-free options and we we really take pride and we put this on the sign on creating a safe space for everyone. So that's that's the experience that I want anyone to feel when they walk into a plant burger. Um, this is an inclusive um, space where you are welcome no matter who you are uh, or what you've done. This, this is a place where we uh, elevate and empower our people to enjoy new beginnings. Um, and we invite everyone to eat the change with us, as we say, um, which is to really to say that your dietary choices matter um, not only to your personal health and to um, the food system that you're creating, but also to the planet that we leave behind for an, for the next generation. So eat the change is a, is a call to action. Um, let's be conscious as consumers of what we're supporting because our dollars ultimately are our vote for, uh, for the world we live in. Yeah. I've, I was going to ask you, do you, do you kind of have to take steps to overcome maybe skepticism regarding, you know, taste people who are used to eating regular burgers. Now they have to come and eat, eat plant burgers. You have to overcome that. Maybe they've accepted that they might enjoy plant burgers, but now they're going to be judged because they had burgers last night or something like that. How do you overcome all that stuff? Great question. And this is something that I struggle with daily because uh, I work, you know, in marketing and I'm always thinking about how we expand our audience. How do we reach omnivores that's our that's our target audience um that also comprises 95 percent of the market so if we're only serving vegans and vegetarians we're not really doing a good job of um creating systemic change we need to bring more people um into into our business into our stores um yeah there, there seems to be a lot of resistance especially in the last year um and it's not a coincidence the meat and dairy industries have a really aggressive um propaganda campaign to sow confusion uh, and misinformation in the market um, around the health and environmental benefits of plant-based alternatives. So what was really clear and what I believe is still very clear is that these products that we're serving have clear health benefits for a consumer. There's no cholesterol, there's significantly less saturated fat. So immediately we take out the, the first two most important um, health red flags that that are present in red and processed meats and in and in the burgers of all of our competition uh but but people i think are now questioning that because again there's just a lot of misinformation out there um i will share that you know we do sampling a lot still because it's a really important marketing strategy and uh there there's a lot of pushback food and especially meat is a really delicate issue for consumers it's intrinsically tied to our identities, um, our physiologies even, but our culture and our history 
is informed by the foods that we were fed and and raised on um, and taught that there's nothing wrong with. Um, and so helping people to really just not even give up those foods, but try an alternative can be a really challenging exercise. Um, and it's one that we, we face with um, flavor as our leading tool. Um, we sample out our chili and we won't really even mention unless someone asks uh, that it's plant-based. And then we tell them it's plant-based. Um, people are often blinded by the placebo effect. So um, they have a preconceived notion around what a plant-based burger is going to be like. And so when they try a burger that they know is plant-based, they're not going to like it as much as if they just tried that burger without that, without that knowledge. Um, and we saw this time and again, we actually did a, a campaign called the Plant Believe It Challenge where we fed our burgers to um, influencers and the we had the influencers film their friends eating these burgers without prior knowledge of uh, the fact that it was plant-based. And of the 10 videos we received, not a single person was able to identify that this was a plant-based burger. And at the end of the video, all these um, friends and influencers uh, that we worked with revealed, did you know that this was a plant-based burger? And everyone is shocked and delighted. Um, and uh, I'll just say like that, that was so uplifting to, to see, you know, on flavor, we really are, are right there mm -hmm. um, with the Shake Shacks and the Burger Fries of the world. Uh, there's a lot of contextual factors that, that inhibit people from uh, enjoying this product and embracing it. Um, but we really think that as far as flavor is concerned, we can stand right there with um with our meat-based alternatives um some of our best customers in the early days of silver spring uh they would come come to us around four times a week and they would enjoy you know a double cheeseburger this one woman in particular was an incredibly frequent customer and i, I introduced myself to her and i asked her you know we're, we're so glad to serve you every day is there any reason that you choose to come here um are you a vegetarian? And she looked at me with confusion. She, she asked, well, no, I'm not, you know, I'm not vegetarian. Why do you ask? And that was when I said, well, we're, we're a plant-based burger joint. She did not believe me. No. She had been coming to us for months without knowing that we were serving plant-based burgers. Wow. And it took all these other customers backing me up and saying, no, he's not, he's not, it's not a prank. Like they are serving plant-based burgers uh, for her to finally accept that it's a plant-based burger. And then she was happy. And she was like, Oh, wow, I, I thought plant based burgers tasted like crap, right? So we have these ideas in our head as consumers around what this new thing is going to be like, we're just resistant to change as, as people were creatures of habit. So we're not going to go out of our way to try a new product. If you've been going to, you know, Wendy's your whole life, you're not going to go to a plant burger. If, if you see it, you're going to go to a Wendy's. So it does take a little bit of um, provocation and stirring the pot to get people to uh, try something new and um, ultimately embrace something that, that, that can be really beneficial for them. Wow. That's a, that's an amazing story about that customer. Um, so what are your, you know, plant plant burger is a restaurant uh, like all the other guys that I talked to. So uh, you guys have goals regarding your restaurant, but it's also kind of a mission. What are your, what are your goals kind of moving forward now with 13 locations and, and, you know, what do you, what do you want to do beyond this? Yeah, so I spoke a little bit about this earlier, but um, we want to continue to grow and continue to scale uh, and ultimately to get to a point where we have as many locations as McDonald's, which is incredibly ambitious and uh, somewhat outrageous to say, given that you know we're very early in our business trajectory. Um, but, but simply put, we cannot go about uh, operating our food businesses and our fast food system the way that it's been going. Um, our environment can't sustain it. We know that it's having terrible uh, destructive impacts on human health, especially in America. Um, and it's an outdated mode of delivering sustenance to um, to the human race. So uh, we have to pivot. We have to shift. We feel that our business is perfectly positioned to capture market share from these massive corporate entities, which have really been profiting at the expense of humans and animals and the environmental well-being for so long. Uh, so with a shifting 
tide of um, consumers who increasingly uh, consider those factors when they make a purchase. Um, that combined with the the way that the meat uh, industry is um, starting to to crumble, um, and simultaneously the plant based industry is beginning to scale, uh, we we feel confident that we'll be poised for continued growth and success um, in the years to come. We do have great plans this year for the opening of some more brick and mortar um, locations in the New York region. Uh, so I'm looking forward to opening more plant burgers. Um, and I especially look forward to growing the uh, performance of our pre-existing locations as well. Um, that's an ongoing ongoing uh, battle to, to really win over people. How have you, uh, what, like, what's the most effective way to get people to try it without telling them that it's a plant burger? Um, people respond well to, uh, to free samples, you know, so we have, um, a, a strong field marketing approach to growing our sales. Uh, we have, uh, in addition to that, we have a great location inside of Whole Foods. So we have a stream of people who are conscious consumers coming into the store already. And we position our demo tables there. We offer them a fry. We give them a mini menu. We offer them some chili. Um, and that's just the, the best way that we've seen to, to grow our sales is meeting people face to face, explaining who we are, what we do, um, answering questions. Um, you know, the other way I'll say that uh, we really want to lean into is, um, is through... Uh, breaching these difficult conversations. Um, it shouldn't be the job of a fast food joint to talk about the environmental uh, benefits of the product or the health benefits of the product. But as I said, there's this massive propaganda push from the meat and dairy industries to confuse consumers about um, the benefits of plant-based alternatives. So we as a brand do need to talk about this. Um, as a movement, uh, as a plant-based business, we need to do a better job explaining our value proposition because it is so clear. Um, and as, as a food industry professional, it's an issue that I think needs to be addressed by, um, by every food business, you know, to paint a clear picture in the mind of a consumer around what it is, uh, that is happening when you, when you support a product um, because through supply and demand, you really are directly contributing to the future or downfall uh, or lack, lack of uh, support for any brand. So, um, so we do publish and you can see this on our social media or on our website. We do talk a lot about environmental impact um, and the sheer reality of uh, our product is that comparing, you know, the burger we serve to a beef patty we're saving 99% less water, 93% less land, generating 90% fewer greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, and that should be celebrated. Uh, so we reward our customers. Um, when they purchase, we tell them, you know, you, you've saved this much water. Uh, you've saved this much land and this, these much uh, emissions from going out into the world. Um, that's exciting. Uh, and, and we never accuse others or, or um, criticize people for the choices that they're making. Uh, we would never, you know, be negative as a brand. Uh, but we do need to say that, you know, choosing plant-based is really uh, an important and, and great decision um, for people who want to actuate their values. Um, we all want, we all want to act in the best interest for the planet. We all want to act in the best interest for the animals. We all want to act in the best interest for our own bodies, but often our choices as consumers don't align with that. So we, we seek to make it an upgrade rather than a sacrifice to actually come into alignment with your preexisting values. Um, it can probably be best summarized by our beliefs, uh, which are also on our website. We have these five deep seated beliefs at plant burger, which, um, are, are really our moral compass and how we perceive ourselves and how we prioritize uh, our business. It's really, all number one, it's about bringing people joy. That's what our food does. It brings comfort and joy and love to the world. Um, number two, we can, uh, we, we say respect and celebrate all life. Um, and it's exciting that we're able to offer people 
burgers and cheeseburgers and mushroom bacon barbecue burgers, chicken, chili, chili cheese fries, like all of your favorite classics in a way that doesn't require the loss, uh, the intentional loss of animal life. Um, third, act with intention, treat each other with love, treat the stakeholders with love, reinvest in those stakeholders. Fourth is to connect to the source and understand the people we're serving, understand the teams that work in our stores. What do they need? How can we support them better? Um, and also connect to the source as a call to action to consumers to really think about where's your food coming from um, and, and what is meat comprised of? Because at its base, uh, there are really four main components of meat. Um, it's primarily water. There are trace minerals. And there are lipids, that's the fats, and there are amino acids, that's the proteins. So proteins, fats, trace minerals, and water. And those are all inherently present and abundant in the plant kingdom. Um, and so what we're doing is going directly to the source. We're connecting to the source and deriving meat straight from plants instead of this really wasteful and unnecessary and cruel practice of funneling all of those plants into an animal which has to burn those calories and poop and pee and fart and then ultimately produce uh, a, a product which is a very, very small percentage of their overall weight. So it's just a really inefficient and outdated mode of, of producing protein and calories for, Amer for, for humans. So we're able to skirt around that. And then finally, the deep-seated belief um, that we stick to is create positive change together. Um, and that uh, is all about inclusivity and recognizing that we need to make these foods accessible to everyone um, and uh, and welcoming more people to eat the change with us. Okay, great. Hey, uh, uh, well, congratulations on your success so far. And of course, best wishes on your efforts. You're obviously very passionate and, and enthusiastic about your mission. Hey, can you tell me how... Um, People can not only find out more information about uh, Plant Burger. You you mentioned that you you have a website. Tell me about that. And then if there, if you can think of some right off the top of your head, maybe other resources that might be beneficial for people to, you know, find out more about what you've been talking about. Most definitely, yeah. Well, um, I encourage anyone who uh, who hears this to check us out on all social media platforms, um, Instagram, whether that be Facebook, Twitter. Um, TikTok, we put out a ton of uh, res resources there, um, fun content, um, uplifting content, and um, ultimately helpful content to help people navigate these these uh, difficult questions and, and consumer choices. Um, there is a really amazing project uh, called Project Drawdown that has categorized and listed 100 solutions and more than 100, but the top 100 solutions to reversing climate change. Um, and, and top among those are plant-based diets and reducing food waste. Um, this is effectively a roadmap for how we as, as humanity can save ourselves uh, in the face of climate change and climate chaos. The reality is we have all of the solutions at our fingertips, the technology, um, renewable energy, shifting towards a more sustainable food system is one of the most important things that we can do to preserve our civilization <laughs> over the next hundred years. Uh, so it's a really great resource. And again, one that can help people no matter where you are in life. If you're a business owner, how can you shift your business to being more sustainable? If you're an individual, how can you shift your consumption? How can you cons you know, maybe conserve energy or adopt more um, sustainable uh, practices in, in your own personal life? Um, so I, I really recommend people look at that. Um, and then there's a number of uh, important policies and policy changes that need to happen in America uh, to support a regenerative um, and more just and equitable food system. Things in the farm bill need to change. We can no longer support um, these commodity crops and massive multinational corporations with billions of dollars in subsidies that go to supporting, as I said, these commodity crops, primarily corn, wheat, and soy, um, which are actually used as feed and not food. Uh, they go to supporting animal, to, to feeding animals who are in confined animal feeding operations rather than what our government should be doing, which is supporting small farmers who grow produce and who grow food that actually nourish humans. Um, that is a common sense change in our policy that will have cascading benefits 
economic and health benefits and environmental benefits for Americans. Um, so there's there's policies that need to be supported, and that will also help drive plant-based innovation and access. Um, but I, I really encourage everyone to come into our locations and meet our teams and taste the food because it is remarkably delicious. And that's what we stand by. Like we wouldn't be in business after all this time if we weren't serving delicious, delicious food for people. Um, and so I, I encourage and uh, would, would uh, invite every, everyone who listens to this to come and visit us in our locations in Maryland, DC, Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, and Boston. Um, that's the, that's the, the best way to get in and eat the change. And once you taste it, I think it becomes so much easier. Um, there's a perceived barrier to entry that does not at all align with the reality of the situation. Um, I think a lot of the time we get in our own way when we think, you know, this is going to be the experience or I don't want to try something that's new and different. Uh, once you once you come in and meet our team and hopefully we're sampling at that location at that time, you get to try it for free and then fall in love with with something that um, is going to benefit you and all the other stakeholders. Sounds good. That's that's uh, that's awesome. Hey, uh, last question for you. When you go to Plant Burger then as a customer, um, obviously you quite enjoy the taste of the food. What is your go to item of choice? It's a tough question, uh, and it really just depends on the day and the mood. But I will say that the mushroom bacon barbecue burger is a strong go-to. Um, it is a really bold flavor, very smoky barbecue burger. has roasted portobellos with our homemade barbecue chipotle sauce on it. It's got crispy onions. So the reason we call it the mushroom bacon barbecue burger is because it imitates bacon, but without any fake in bacon. It's just the crispy onion combined with the chewy um, portobellos. So together, they deliver the crunchy, chewy, fatty, and a little bit savory umami of bacon, but without actually uh, having any, you know, um, imitation bacon. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, we have caramelized onions underneath that, this savory, delicious, salty, patty on a potato bun. I am just salivating thinking about it, but that's, that's a go-to. The other thing I'll say is really good is our chili cheese fries, which is a bed of fries, chili dumped on top um, and cheese sprinkled on top of that, all plant-based, all kosher. Um, and that is a really hearty, delicious offering. Uh, that's another standby. For us. Yeah. Wow. Sounds fantastic. Uh, I'm starving now. Well, we'll, we'll encourage everybody to check out uh, plant burger. That's P L N T burger. And uh, Jonah, I really appreciate your time today. It's been great to talk to you. Chad, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for hosting me and hope you have a wonderful day. I hope to open a location in Colorado and come to you soon. I'll, I hope to be there soon. Thanks so much, Jonah. Have a good one. Thank you. You too. So long, so long everybody. Thanks for listening to the top business leaders show powered by rise 25. Visit rise25.com to check out more episodes of the show and to learn more about how you can start your own podcast.